shine on, shine on me. Oh, great light of the world, shine. Star in the night, fall, fall, and surrender it all. Sing a while and believe like a child. I just wanna be a reflection. Fall down upon the ground, press my face against the earth, till my heart it rises over my head. As the weed it bows down low, when the autumn wind blows, I kneel before the one I love. Find me.
Smiling casualties Oh God, grant us peace In these sleepless nights I can hardly breathe Despite brutality I know that we'll be free I know that we'll be free Let the light keep it shining Let it break to the darkness, all the love dares us to see, we'll all be free. In these desperate times, love will hold us here. Love will join our hands, teach us to have no fear. So we lay our head down. you. Our worship begins this morning with the liturgy of light and the blessing of this Paschal candle.
This candle symbolizes Christ's breaking of the darkness of sin and death to bring us all the Easter victory. The Paschal candle, this Christ candle, shines as a symbol of the resurrection throughout the Easter season for the next 50 days, as well as it's present at all baptisms and at all funerals. Let us pray. Oh God, you are like a refiner's fire, and your spirit kindles our hearts, the hearts of your faithful. Bless this flame, we ask, and those who keep this Easter celebration so that burning with desire for life with you, they may be found fit to take part in that festival of light, which has no ending, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, and forever. The beginning and the end, Alpha and Omega. All time belongs to Christ and all ages. To Christ be glory and dominion forever and ever. These nails that we place in this candle represent the wounds of Christ. By his holy and glorious wounds, may Christ our Lord guard us, keep us, and heal us. Amen. May the light of Christ who rises this day in glory scatter the darkness of our hearts and our minds. Let us pray. Almighty God, once we were in darkness, but since we have become the Lord's people, we are in the light. Pour out your blessing on this light so that all who share in your holy mysteries may be filled with your grace. Help us to live as people who belong to the light, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. risen Christ is risen. risen Christ is risen. risen Let's continue to worship this morning.
A reading from the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away all the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. 
For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And all that had been commanded them they told briefly to those around Peter, and afterward Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. No. be seated. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Every Lent we start out with ashes, um, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, to remember how much we were connected to death. We face our mortality. And as Lent ends, we walk smack into Holy Week and Good Friday. Here Jesus enters the ashes. He takes on our death. Then in some mysterious way, he overcomes the ashes. He conquers death and gives us the promise that death is no longer permanent for the human race. I've lost three friends to death in the last three months Resurrection reminds me that those losses 
will not be forever. The resurrection means there are no dead ends. Ultimately, things are not going to end in tragedy and loss, though we face those things now. Easter is the feast of hope for the Christian church. This is the feast that says God will turn everything that maims or destroys into life and beauty. That all loss is redeemable. That God will put all wrongs to right. It reveals that love endures forever. That love is stronger than death. And that love wins. There's so many things we could talk about here. Jesus' resurrection is just so central to the story of our faith. It's Paul who writes, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. <clears throat> and if Christ has not been raised, excuse me, <clears throat> our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, then we are to be pitied more than all people. There is just one thing I want to point out. The resurrection touches our everyday life. And the thing that I want to focus on is that how Jesus is present to the human race now post-resurrection. When you read about the disciples discovering Jesus had been written, had been risen, the Gospels keep saying, they are asking, where is he? Where is Jesus? What have you done with him? They were haunted by the empty tomb. Some theologians believe that the focus of the gospel on the empty tomb is signaling something about the character of Jesus' presence post-resurrection. That perhaps the empty tomb was not so much an indication of the absence of Jesus as much as it was a signal that Jesus was going to be present in the lives of the disciples in a very different world, a way and present in the world in a very different way. In other words, how Jesus was present to humanity after the resurrection is completely new and unexpected and opens up what we understand to be the new creation. This would explain why Mary Magdalene, who was from the inner circle of Jesus' friends and is the first to see the risen one, why she doesn't recognize him. Why she thinks the person she sees is a gardener. How could she have not recognized him? Because he was present in a different way. Later on that first resurrection day, Jesus is walking alongside two of his disciples on the way to Emmaus. These guys had spent years with Jesus. And yet the text says in Luke 24, Jesus approached and began traveling with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Why couldn't they recognize him? The pre-resurrected Jesus didn't do this kind of thing. He was born in a manger. He carried out his life confined to time and space. You could locate him. He grew up in Nazareth. He began his ministry, moved from town to town, place to place. Crowds followed him where he went. The disciples were with him. He would jump on a boat, cross the lake. Crowds would follow him to the other side of the lake. You could find Jesus. He was there to teach them. He would heal them. He would feed them. Even when he snuck off to pray, it says they would go out and find him, and they found him. But here, in the resurrection, something has radically changed. They can't seem to locate Jesus. They recognize him, then they don't recognize him. He appears, and right in front of their eyes, he disappears during this post-resurrection season. 
Something happened to Jesus in the resurrection that introduced a whole kind of new presence of Jesus. Jesus was no longer to be found anywhere in particular, but is found everywhere in particular. <laughs> and in the ascension, the text says he goes to sit at the right hand of God. Vincent Pazudu writes, If God is omnipresent, then what else is the ascension but the attribution of the same omnipresence to Christ? Precisely insofar as he is seated at the right hand of God, of an, uh, right hand of an omnipresent God, Christ too must be understood, not as having gone anywhere, but having gone everywhere. This is the new kind of presence. Jesus isn't just hanging down by the boat. He, he is down by the boat and he is also in this room with us. And he is with us whether we see him or whether we don't. That was the whole teaching that was going on post-resurrection. Text we'll be reading over the next several weeks. He will never leave us nor forsake us is what we find out through that story. That's what the resurrection funds. God being with us always. There's a kind of faith trick to seeing this that we have to learn though. Don't just look for Jesus in your emotions. Though he will come to you there. Don't just look at Jesus or look for Jesus in your circumstances. I mean, he certainly will come there. Jesus does answer prayer. But look for him in other places, particularly around other people. Places like the church, the body of Christ. <laughs> this is tough because so many people in the church act like jackals. Right? And, and leaders in the organ, and organizations fail. But Jesus is still in his body. The church. And Jesus can be found in her sacraments. And when she gathers. It was Luther who purportedly said, The church is a whore. But she is my mother. If you want to be with Jesus, be part of the church even in times when it's painful. If you want to be with Jesus, another place that he frequents is, is being with those who are hurting. Jesus claims when he's talking about the last judgment, he says in Matthew 25, then the king will say to the good people on his right, come, my father has given you his blessing. Come and receive the kingdom God has prepared for you since the world was made. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was alone, I was lonely and away from home, and you invited me into your house. I was without clothes, and you gave me something to wear. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the good people will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and give you food? When did we see you thirsty? And give you something to drink. When did we see you alone? And away from home and invite you into our house. When did we see you without clothes and give you something to wear? When did we see you sick or in prison and care for you? Then the king will answer. I tell you the truth. Anything you did for any of my people here. You also did for me. If you want to be with Jesus. Be with people who are in need and care. Jesus' presence is also found in every other person you encounter, believe it or not. The ones you absolutely love and the ones you absolutely do not. First John, John claims, we love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and yet hates his brother or sister, <clears throat> he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother and sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. This new presence of Jesus that was put into play at the resurrection is surprising indeed. 
Because we're to see the risen Jesus in every place, in every circumstance, through every circumstance, and in every person. Jesus may not be seen cl most clearly in those spaces, because there are places and circumstances and people that are infected with evil, a little bit creepy, maybe even demonic. But we're to look for Jesus there, irrespective that somehow his presence is there because his presence is everywhere. On some level, level this whole idea of faith is like a where is Waldo campaign. <clears throat> we look at the landscape and we look for Jesus. When we do this, when we insist that the risen Lord is in whatever context we are in and with whomever we are with, this is the heralding of the gospel. This is the good news. Jesus is alive. He's present here. We're not just to go into all the world and preach about personal salvation and to give people some spiritual laws. We're not to get up into people's faces with moralisms about how they're to act or how big their carbon footprint should be or about their view on sexuality or gender or about whether our government should be kinder or meaner on our southern border or about what books should be in our kids' libraries. I mean, certainly feel free to do that stuff. I mean, either as a crotchety conservative or a crazy liberal, do what you want to do. But don't be confused. That stuff has absolutely nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Christ bearers, we are simply to see people as treasures and to meet needs in their lives when we see them, even if we perceive them as totally inappropriate and completely whacked out politically or socially, we're still supposed to see them in spite of what they're like. Listen to Jesus on this point. This is Matthew 5. He's telling his disciples, you guys have heard that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. There's something really good about that verse. We'd prefer to love our neighbor and sort of hate our enemies, right? But I say to you, love your enemies. Ah, the people that grind you on. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may prove yourselves to be sons of the Father. This is what God is mostly like. Who is in heaven and he causes his sunshine to rise on evil people as well as the good people. He sends rain on the righteous people, but also on the unrighteous people. There's this reckless, incautious kind of kindness that emanates out of the Father, and if you want to be like the Father, if you want to be sons of the Father, do this. Do this. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even tax collectors who they did not like, do they not do the same? And if you only greet your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Even the Gentiles who have no faith, they are doing the same. Therefore, you shall be perfect. What is perfect? Reckless love. Perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Full of mercy. Why? Because mercy triumphs over judgment. One of my favorite passages about Jesus walking with the disciples. They're breaking the Sabbath laws. The Pharisees are quick to point it out because people who are very, well, you get those people. They always want to point out what somebody is doing wrong. And when Jesus responds to them in the book of Matthew about this, the other gospels speak to it. He says to them, God desires mercy, not judgment. Not sacrifice. Mercy. And he says, you have condemned the innocent. Why? Because they didn't see that they were hungry. You know why most people act the way they do? They're afraid and they're hungry. And if you're not careful, you'll just react to that instead of seeing them. Seeing the face of Jesus on them because in some way, Jesus is there. I want to close with just one story in my own life. Um, you're going to see through the lectionary again 
these post-resurrection stories that all of us, the reason we have testimonies is because they're post-resurrection testimonies. What are they saying? Jesus is with us. And he shows up in surprising ways in our lives, whether it's answered prayer or some way to work out strife in our lives or some way that we lean in and it affects every part of our lives. But this particular moment in my life was a long time ago. And it was a time when it was 1982, 83 in there. And this is right after the AIDS virus had been identified, HIV. And what was happening in the culture was everything you read was talking about how dangerous it was going to be. Some claimed it would decimate the human population eventually. There were claims that people didn't really know how you got it. They, they knew it was involved in sexuality. But they also thought maybe you'd get it through any kind of bodily fluids by sweat, tears. And there was a palpable fear in the air. By 1989, this little clip, and I'm a little bit shy to show it, especially if you've got little ones, you might want to cover their eyes for a second. This shows the kind of level of intensity. This is a public broadcasting thing that goes on. This is on the air, right? So just show a little piece of this. I'm going to show a lot of it. But just show a piece of it. Just again, cover that's a little bit Halloweenish. So maybe cover your little child's eyes. Only gays and IV drug users were being killed by AIDS. But now we know every one of us could be devastated by it. Okay, that's about enough. <laughs> this thing goes on for th talking about how this will kill perhaps as many as World War II killed, 65 million people. There was a palpable fear in the air. That's what I wanted to tell you. And I remember those days, and I remember reading so some of the books, and I had a friend that died of AIDS who was a thoracic surgeon. It's very scary, those of you that are old enough to remember. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm in a church in St. Louis. I had preached there. It's a large church, 3,000, 4,000. And I had been preaching there for some time, and some of the people knew me from my times there. I was sitting in the front, and this gentleman came up to me. It was in the spring, 84, I think. He comes up to me and uh, walks up to me, and, and I saw him. He looked kind of sickly, and I, uh, he said, Pastor Gunger, he said, I've heard you talk here quite a few times. And he said, he said you, I'm often moved, and, and I so appreciate what you do. Well, I thought that was sweet. So anyway, he said, would you pray for me? Well, my first instinct, I reached over and grabbed his arm. I said, absolutely. And he said, I have AIDS. I want to tell you that everything in my body wanted to do this. But there was something else going inside. There was some other way in which Jesus was present that surprised me. And I remember instead of that impulse, even though it was screaming in my mind, there was another impulse that said, move in. And so instead of pulling away, I moved in closer. And I put my hand on his shoulder. He said, would you pray for me? I said, I sure will. Now, I knew what all the implications were. This is early on. Perhaps he was gay. I mean, I, I, mean, I didn't know all how he did this, contracted this, got involved with this. But I put my hand on his neck, and I remember pulling his cheek to my cheek. Now, my mind is screaming, you're going to die. And my mind was screaming, be careful, he, he might think you're gay. These crazy thoughts are going through my mind. But my heart is screaming, Jesus is here. And I remember as I hugged him and I began to pray, it broke him. And he began to weep, which I thought was precious. But then I got to face tears. And I remember in my mind, you know, your mind oftentimes doesn't always go with what's going on in your heart. And I remember in my mind I thought, Gail might kill me for doing this. But what a way to die. Loving some, someone who's been marked as unclean and unlovable. And as we prayed, I sensed God's presence. I sensed something sweet happening. And then we were done. That's what resurrection means to me. What happened there was not about four spiritual laws for 
personal salvation. It wasn't about ethics. It wasn't about taking the right stand on issues that affect us all. It was about resurrection. It was about Jesus being everywhere because he is risen. you stand with me as we recite the creed together we believe in one God the Father the Almighty maker of heaven and earth of all that is seen and unseen we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ the only Son of God eternally begotten of the Father God from God light from light true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others, and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them to the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. of Christ be always with you. 
Would you turn to your brothers and sisters and greet them with grace and peace? Grace and peace to you all. It is good to be with you to worship this Easter Sunday. And now we orient ourselves toward being people of contentment and people of generosity. This is the time when we offer our collective gifts as a community. We've offered one another this gift of grace and peace. Here in just a moment, we'll come bearing the gifts of bread and wine in the Eucharist. And we also come bringing our gifts of uh, our tithes and, and our offerings in this moment. Most of uh, those who attend sanctuary and give to sanctuary regularly do so as a recurring gift, which means it happens out there in the internet someplace, and we don't really give it a second thought. But we do want to let this moment touch us and shape us and form us into being a kind of people. And so this is why we pause and acknowledge what we're doing. The easiest way, if you are interested in jumping in to give uh, to Sanctuary today, is through our Tithely system, which you can access by texting the word GIVE to that number on the screen. And there is also uh, an offering box in the lobby for those who have cash or checks and tangible gifts this morning. As we prepare to give, would you join me in this liturgy of generosity? Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world, and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds and willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. Amen. May this be true of our community. May you be blessed as you give today. And now we come as we prepare to receive the gifts of God for the people of God. Oh, Spirit of the Lord, bless us. 
Let's just take a moment and acknowledge the fact that um, we have sinned against God and our neighbor. In confessing my own story just a few minutes ago, I'm so tr just horrified by some of the thoughts that I have carried in my mind unchecked when it comes to responding to my life. And uh, to say it out loud and to know that God forgives is a good thing, right? So think about this week. Let the Spirit shed light on maybe ways in which you crossed a line somehow in your relationship with somebody, in a conversation, in your own sense of taking care of yourself and others around you. Or we've missed the mark. That's all sin is. This is not a cosmic smackdown. But this is the time to just be honest and say, I'm not perfect and I've missed the mark. And to know that God welcomes us nonetheless. So let's pray this together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And receive this. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, for he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death. And by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only Son, eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of us all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night that he was given over to death and suffering, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, a thanks we now enter, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me.
After the supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. Family, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, taste, and see that the Lord is good.
Would you join me in prayer? Father of all, we give you thanks. Wait. <laughs> there we go. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share in Christ's death live in his risen life. We who drink this bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights light to the world. Keep us in the hope that you have set before us so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth lives to praise your name. Amen. And receive this blessing as you go out into your Easter year. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do as well, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Say